Hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I'm hoping that you have enjoyed uh, the previous episodes that we have presented to you from this new series called Exposing the Myth. With us here, of course, remotely, our dear brother Mel, who have done amazing research and showed uh, how uh, Zoroastrianism have contributed to reshaping early Islam and many of its rituals and customs and even proper names uh, uh, of certain objects or certain features that are very important to Islam. Today, we're going to talk about something uh, at least, uh, you know, in the same theme, but maybe not tied to the previous one. It's about the question, was Aisha and Fatima borrowed from Jewish sources to link them with Ishmael? And with us here in the studio remotely to answer this question, our dear brother Mel. Mel, thank you again for this research, this fascinating material. And uh, hopefully you can help us now with the uh, link between Aisha, Fatima and Ishmael. Okay, so I, I suppose the thing to say at the outset, this is um, like a, a white paper here. Um, there is a scholarly discussion around this question, which came first. It's a bit like the chicken and egg. Um, I'm convinced that based on the evidence that Aisha and Fatima were referred to in Jewish sources centuries before Islam took them over. Um, so I, I leave it to the audience to decide for themselves if you are persuaded by the evidence. So according to the sin, uh, Muhammad was married to Aisha and had a daughter called Fatima. The problem is we don't have any contemporary sources from the seventh century that testify testifies to these being real living people. Um, an awful lot of the Hadiths depend on Aisha being a real person. Um, there's a huge number of, of Hadiths attributed to her. But if she's not real, then what, what status do those Hadiths have? Um, one objection is if people are going to fabricate stories about Muhammad because they are inventing a new religion, they're obviously going to fabricate stories that make Muhammad look good. And Jay, I'm sure you remember this line from David Wood back in 2020. Um, so let's remind ourselves where these tales were written. So, you know, they were written in Zoroastrian lands, as we, as we saw earlier. Um, however, as we already saw from the Chinese source Du Huan, who lived in Persian lands in the 750s, that the Zimzim or Zoroastrians practice incest, incest, and in this respect are the worst of all the barbarians. So if this is true, then it wouldn't be beyond imagination for a culture that thinks that this is acceptable to write also other really weird tales about Aisha and so forth. It fits entirely in with the Zoroastrian outlook. Um, if this was the very culture that the Hadiths and the Sira were written, then we needn't be too surprised at the depravity of their writings. The principle of embarrassment doesn't apply here, but rather the principle of self-justification, making up stories to justify contemporary amoral behavior. That's what I would argue in relation to these. So where did the names Aisha and Fatima come from? If people are going to fabricate stories about Muhammad because they are inventing a new religion, they are obviously going to fabricate stories to make Muhammad look good. And how would these make Muhammad look good? by linking him with Ishmael. So I'm going to argue that ultimately the, the reference to Aisha and Fatima were about linking Muhammad to them. I'm sorry, linking Muhammad, not just to them, but to ultimately to Ishmael. So the proposal is that the Targum Pseudo Jonathan is a fourth century AD Jewish Targum that mentions Adisha, i.e. Aisha, and Fatima as the wives of Ishmael thus proving, if the dating is correct, that this is another of countless harvestings of Jewish sources by Islam to build its own mythology. So the wider context is we've already seen hundreds and hundreds of examples of borrowings from Judaism. So this would be only one more. We don't find examples that, to my knowledge, of Judaism borrowing from Islam. Why would it borrow from, from a religion it considers to be false? It, the traffic is always one way. Now, the relevant passage found in the Targum can be broken down into its Hebrew text and pseudo-Jonathan components as follows. So, first of all, it is a, a, a reiteration of Genesis 21:21. 21, 21. He dwelt in Faran, married an Egyptian whom his mother brought him. Then there is the expansion on that, which is the Jewish um, 
um, gathering of folklore around it. He first married Aditya, put her away, then married Fatima, whom, and then it dot, dot, dot. However, from the 4th century to the 9th century, variants of the name Aditya circulated, hence why in the 9th century, Jewish Midrash known as Perke de Rabbi Eliezer, we find the name Aisha in place of Aditya. It is clear that there was a progression from Aditya to Aisha. This name was then picked up and used in relation to the wife of Muhammad, who was viewed as the embodiment of Ishmael. So here is the text from um, Perke de Rabbi Eliezer. Ishmael sent for a wife from among the daughters of Moab, and Aisha was her name. So this is referring to Ishmael, who you know lived in Old Testament times. We're not talking about the seventh century here. Um, so in terms of this, arguments for Targum Pseudo Johnson's antiquity include the presence of Jewish literary Aramaic, which necessitates use from the first to the second century sources to which a fourth century Jewish uh, writers would have greater access to. So what this means is, that there's a type of Aramaic which is archaic, which comes from the first and second century. It's in that writing, which would suggest that it's 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 very old. Okay, the argument that the presence of JLA can only be found in Ankelos, which is written in 600 AD, has already been debunked since the finding of the first century uh, document, as as it's called there, written in JLA. Flesher proposes that uh, Pseudo Johnson derives from a first century text in written JLA rather than the late Babylonians. In other words, the central argument against it being fourth century has been demolished by the fact that there are other texts out there that come from before 600 AD that they could have uh, sourced. Flesher's thesis maintains that priests wrote proto Antilus in Jerusalem. The JLA they used also appears in first century Jerusalem um, Osri inscriptions, common writings, and the Bar Koshba letters. A literary language, it required a structure of support and an educational system for its dissemination. Uh, it appears until 135 AD in the extant literature. Now, all of this material is coming from Beverly Mortensen's book, The Priesthood in Targum Jonathan. Um, she is the four, uh, what's the word, the, the, the most important scholar in, in this area. She, I think no one has done as much work on this uh, a Targum, that's her. So the case for why it is 4th century, this study shows that it differs from the Palestinian Targum tradition, represented by Proto-PT in two ways. It is 2.8 times larger, and it speaks to priests about themselves and maintaining the cult, while Proto-PT talks or speaks to ordinary individuals about their keeping the Torah. Now, a focus on the Jewish Priesthood and temple practices only make sense in the context of realistic prospect of rebuilding the temple, of which there hasn't been any since the occupation of the Temple Mount by the Arabs since the 7th century. So it would mean that it would have to be from an earlier period. She says that I consider that the writer is a priest and that he writes exclusively for priests. With this as the primary consideration, we turn to the matter of dating. When in the time after the completion of the Torah would a writer embark upon an ambitious translation of the Hebrew Pentateuch that addresses an audience of priests? The question concerns opportunity, motivation, and expectation. She says that we make this selection based on the rationale for writing a massive work directed at temple priests. Why would anyone undertake such an effort if he had no hope of a temple? Of the two eras, only one offers such a hope, the fourth century CE. A short-lived expectation for rebuilding the temple arose during the reign of Emperor Julian, who reigned from 361 to 363 AD. He wrote a letter promising such a feat shortly before his death. Word of his intention had likely circulated since the beginning of his reign. So she argues that this is really the only time that it made sense to write this Targum. This was the opportunity that was given to them to rebuild the temple. At this time, the temple had been destroyed for 291 years. The new emperor, rumor has it, talks of rebuilding the temple. Even though his plan satisfies a grudge against the Christians, his action functions as a real boon for, for Jews and their cult. The author, in preparation for the temple's readiness, plies his efforts to ensure that an eager and well-prepared priesthood stands ready.
to conduct all the ancient rituals. Uh, Julian becomes emperor of the Roman Empire in 361. He cares little for Christians, so he exhorts the Jewish leaders to return to their ancient sacrificial worship. They protest that they must have a temple according to their law in Jerusalem. He gives them money to do just that. The pagans help them, for building the temple will disqualify Jesus' prophecy that the temple will fall. So in conclusion, the Targum Suda Johnson predates Islam's expansion of the story. PRE was written at a time when Islam was beginning to write its own origin story in the form of Ibn Hisham. However, as it was a compendium of early traditions, we are still on solid ground in asserting it came before the sin. So I'm very persuaded uh, by um, Beverly's um, argument, and she goes into great detail in the Targum in terms of pointing out how much it is really a priestly text for priests. So we'll hand it back to you. Yep. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, we really appreciate uh, this research. And I'm hoping that we can connect back again and we either expand on this or add more to it. Uh, Jay, any last word? No, I like this. This is fascinating because it is also uh, the pseudo Jonathan uh, Targum of John Per Ben Michael. That also you get the story of uh, the, the two sons of Adam and the, the, right. the bird. Uh, yeah, Habil, Africa, Habil, yeah. And so you can see these are all being pulled out. They're introduced into the Quran. In this case, not in the Quran, but in this case, it's in the traditions to give some type of body to these two, uh, the right. wives and the daughter of Muhammad. Wonderful. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you, everyone. And this is Al Padi. Over and out. God bless. Take care. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.